modern now. And the big one here is a card that, uh, uh, you know, at the Pro Tour, I'm sure when you were testing, that everyone thought was on the decline, Liliana the Veil. Vale. There are four copies here in Ian's deck. Well, and then, you know, and I've, I've hammered home this point, but I think with Black, everybody knew there's going to be a deck. Like, Thoughtseize, Dark Confidant, and Liliana the Veil, vale, together as a trio, are is such a strong core of a deck that, you know, there, everybody knew there had to be a deck somewhere that could play all three of those cards. Now, John left the format, well, or at least left the prominence of the format, sure. and, you know, we didn't really know what the shell for those cards was, and Green Black Rock might just be it. Brian Kilberg going to start off with what is basically his invitational card, a Wild Nakato off of a stomping ground. He'll start round number four at 18. Again, of course, Brian does have three buys in this tournament, so this will be his first round of action, thankfully for him, making it in time off of his flight, as Ian is going to sacrifice a Misty Rainforest. We'll see what he's going to search up. You can take a look at his hand. He has not one, but two copies of Phyrexian Obliterator in his hand. Also has a Victim of Night as a one of removal spell. Yeah, this is actually a matchup that I think Ian Hendry is more than happy Happy to see. Uh, as a black-green control deck, he is exceptionally good at killing creatures, mm -hmm. which Brian plays a lot of. Now, normally what a zoo deck would do against black-green rock was that it would just flood the board. It would be like triple one-drop, play creatures faster than Ian can kill them, can kill the creatures, and then use burn spells to finish it off. But because Brian's playing big zoo, his ability to just like throw out creatures really quickly is a lot lower. You know, he might make a three-drop like Knight of the Reliquary, and if Ian plays this gets the right draw, he can just keep pace, kill spells with, keep pace on killing spells with Brian's creatures. We see a Twilight Mire here from Ian. We'll see if he's going to use a removal spell right away. And I think, you know, because Brian is such a sappy player, Victim of Night just looks like a removal spell in this situation. But this is a one of that, that Redo played in his deck list. And obviously Brian is very well in tune with the people who are playing at the Pro Tour, reads a lot of magic articles and things of that nature. So I think right away he's going to know, okay, I know exactly what deck I'm up against now. Yeah, Victim of Night, certainly not the kind of card that's just a universal inclusion in the format. Um, talking with, I talked with Matthew Costa, who's also on the list about it, and he just kind of thought this was the best two mana black removal spell. You know, you have options like, uh, well, you just have tons of options, I suppose. Doomblade, go for the throat, smother, but they felt Victim was, the double black wasn't a problem, so this was just the most universal answer. Scavenging ooze here from Hendry with the green available to make that into a 3-3 if he'd like. You saw in Kibler's last turn, he just played a Plains and a Quasali Pride Mage, a card that he feels is, you know, it, it, it's a great role player in the deck. It's not anything that's insane like a Nacatl or Knight of the Reliquary, but, you know, it does a nice job of just being able to obviously take care of artifacts and enchantments, great in the affinity matchup, good against Birthing Pot, and, you know, it also gets in there for three as well. So a great role player in a zoo deck as Kibler is going to use a Lightning Bolt to take care of Scavenging ooze. Yeah, Ian can either gain he can gain a life here. If he had a second ooze, he wouldn't. But I think he's just he's just valuing his life total, which, given the pair of obliterators he had in his hand, I really like. Um, I do think is right. This game is favoring Ian at the moment. Brian's not playing more than one card per turn, mm -hmm. which or one creature per turn, which is something that Ian can actually keep pace with. Hendry's going to draw his card. You see among his lands, he's got an Urborg Tomb of, tomb of Yawgmoth, excuse me, which turns everything into a swamp, including the Fetchland in his hand. And of course, that's there to help facilitate Phyrexian Obliterator, which will probably come down now. And that card's so great in this deck against Kilber because basically it puts the attacking to a halt, but also it makes it so that he has to draw Path to Exile to ever really be able to get through. Yeah, that card is a nightmare for Zoo to deal with. Almost all their removal is damage-based, and you really don't want to kill Obliterator that way. Um, you're, so you're right when you say he's pretty much on path to exile. Now you see Hendry is considering maybe just playing a Dark Confidant this turn. Oh, okay. Yeah. It looks like he's going to maybe go scavenging who's into Dark Confidant. Yeah, it looks like he's doing going to go ahead and do that. Um, I don't know. I would almost want to just jam Pyrex and Obliterators, but Ooze is pretty good here. Now, he's going to sacrifice the fetch land yeah. here. Of note, he didn't have to do that. Yes. Because he yeah. could have tapped it for black and used Twilight Mire as the second mana. Now, that's an interaction that if you're not familiar with exactly how Orbord works, you know, the fact that you can actually just use that to tap for mana, it seems a little counterintuitive. Fetch lands don't tap for mana. They search for lands. Right. So he's going to search up a forest. He'll still be able to cast Dark Confidant this turn, but he could have he could have saved himself a plenty of damage. And again, every point, especially when you're playing against a zoo deck, be it big or little, does matter. Yeah, and it's actually the Thuff Fetchland thing actually sometimes comes up because Fetchlands, when they sacrifice, actually do tap. So if you yep. tap your Fetchland to cast something, you actually can't, you can't then sack it. It looks like he's just going to go oozing right away, so he's going to turn this into a 3-3 immediately, and the reason being, of course, is because Kibler has an ooze of his own, so he wants to ensure that he'll get an activation off of this. So, Kibler will take a draw. 
Yeah, so I think, so the reason he's, he figured the obliterators can wait, what's important right now is that he stops Brian's ooze from growing. See, Kibler has a lightning helix in his hand, also has Knight of the Reliquary. He's going to shuffle those really, really quickly so that we can't keep up, but we'll try. Yeah. So this is where I think, I don't know, it seems like Ian might have been hurt from eating that last wild in the cattle. If he hadn't, he would have been able to make a 4-4 mm -hmm. ooze this turn, and it would be safe from lightning helix. Force kind of the sweet spot against this deck, too. Obviously, all of their burn is basically three points. And if you're familiar right. with Brian, you know the kind of the removal suite that he's playing. He wrote an article on, Star on the premium side of Star City Games. He basically said, hey, here's my 75 that I'm going to play at this tournament, very close to what I played at the Pro Tour. And if you're just familiar with Brian at all, you know he's not really the Tribal Flames kind of guy. No, and we see so he's going to kill the scavenging ooze on the inside, going to eat it to pump his own ooze, and is able to put Ian down to 12. Wolfrex and Obliterator, it, it's, it's, it's your time. It's got to be time for him. I, I, you know, he waited one turn. I don't think he can wait a second one. And there is the 5-5. Five five. So now things get very difficult for Kibler because getting through that thing is a major pain unless you have Path Exile, as you do see the 5-5 five five horror. And what will be a bigger issue is right now this stops Kibler from attacking, but it doesn't let Ian deal damage. The second Obliterator is going to be really bad news yeah. because then Ian will start to be able to attack with one and hold one back. And now this is part of the reason I think that Kibler kind of likes a, a big zoo style deck because, you know, against a little zoo deck, this might just completely cold him out and not be able to do anything. But with Big Zoo, you've got some more play. For example, the Knight of the Reliquary that's in his hand. He can deploy that and say, all right, I'll start searching up some value lands, maybe find another Rising Canopy, maybe find a Kessig Wolf Run, and, you know, get some card advantage that way. Yeah, two cards remain in Ian's hand. He doesn't play the Sajiri step in his deck for Knight of the Reliquary. We're going back to the things that you can find. I was trying to think if there's a way he can push a creature past the Obliterator, and it looks like on this, the only way to pa push a creature past is by using Kessig Wolf Run, mm -hmm. which means he pretty much would have to be dealing lethal that turn for it to be worth it. Yeah. So you see Kibler is going to figure out, all right, what's the best course of action? This isn't the first time he's played against the 5-5. This deck is growing in popularity quite a bit. People do love their black and green cards. He's going to play a Misty Rainforest. Sacrifice that, go down to 19, get another basic. Yeah. I would say people everywhere are always looking for an excuse to play cards like a Phyrexian Obliterator. Yeah. It's just too much fun to not play. As you do see Kibler go down to 19, let's see what he's going to follow up with here. He's going to play another Aquarius and a Tarmogoyf. He'll take one to do so off of the Rising Canopy. He's cardless. Hendry, again, does have Frex and Obliterate. I believe Dark Confidant in his hand. And we'll see exactly how this game is going to go now because Kibler's cards are obviously all on the table. There are some yeah. good ones, but they're all out. Kibler's winding up for one lethal swing right now, mm -hmm. and that's going to be his goal because he can't really hit the Obliterator. He can't let that trigger result, the, the making him sacrifice things. So he's going to hope that one attack will be enough to just deal 12. Looks like another Dark Confidant wants to draw here for Hendry. Yeah, those guys are typically good. They're a little, they're a little scary right now because of the plan that Kibler is on, as, as mentioned. Uh, he's going to be able to find Kessig Wolf run off that knight very quickly. Now we are getting aggressive. In comes the first Obliterator. It's going to deal five. It's going to put Kibler down to 13. Now, this is a little bit risky because, you know, Kibler could certainly be okay with making an attack here and losing some permanence. Yeah, I'm going to back up. This is why I kind of thought that on turn four, Ian should have, I wish he would have played the Obliterator. It's, this could have been happening a turn earlier. Remember, he's threatening a 10-point swing next turn. Was that a, I think that, I'm not sure if that was a path next. I think it was a path Brian would have cast it already, so we'll see. He's going to start, looks like, by sacrificing a rising canopy. That's going to grow the Knight of the Reliquary just a little bit here. Oh, well, it looks like one. Yeah. That's a huge draw if it is. Yeah, Kibler kind of doing the math here, seeing how much he can attack for. You've got Tarmogoyf sitting at a 2-3. You've got Ooze sitting at a 3-3. You've got a Kasali Pride Mage. 3-2-2-7. Yeah. Two, two, There's your path. Yeah, and that should, I think, be lethal. That knight is a... I want to say that knight is a 5. Yep, he's going to attack with everybody here. And looks like after the Dust Settles, the Kibler's counting all the damage here. We can count the damage that we do know, which is 3 from the Ooze, 2 from the Goyf. So that's 5, 6, 7. seven. Yeah, and so it's, it's already nine. The question is whether or not there are three lands in Kibler's yard. There's already a Horizon Canopy, and this Verdant Catacombs could be there. I don't know if there's another land in Kibler's yard. Yeah, we saw him sack a fetch a little bit earlier, so you see both players are adding up the damage here, and we'll see if it is going to be lethal or not as they do go through it here in a moment. You see Hendry's going to shuffle yep, those two Dark Confidants, and that's going to do it. So Brian Kibler with a timely Path to Exile is going to win game number one over Ian Hendry. Big Zoo up a game over Black Green Obliterator yeah, I, Rock. I feel like Kibler dodged a bullet a little bit there. The, a double Obliterator hand's very good against his deck. Yeah, I agree. Um, 
the, the, obviously the pass to exile draw was timely. The fact that he got an extra turn to start his attack with, I thought was very pivotal there too. I agree. We'll take a look at the sideboards. We're going to start with Ian's since he'll be on the play. And Matthias, you have that in front of you. All right, so when you look over at Ian's sideboard, uh, Ian's playing a lot of cards that are good in specific matchups. You see cards like Fulminator Mage. That would be for, you know, that that's good against control decks. You see Creeping Corrosion for Affinity. They're not a particularly, like, they're not, there are only a couple cards that are good in this matchup, and that would be his two death marks. Kibler is playing a green-based creature deck. It's just a very efficient removal spell. His deck's already very good against Zoo in the main deck. He also plays one Thrun in the sideboard, which if he wants another card that is like, removal-proof, that is an excellent blocker, we probably could see him bring that in. Uh, lastly, and I don't think we'll see this one, he, he has a Sword of Light and Shadow that gains him life, but I doubt he has time to use that in the matchup. Yeah, I think it'll be difficult to actually find time to use that. We'll take a look at Kibler's here. He's got a Torpor Orb, a copy of Ethersworn Canonist, two Aven Mind Sensor, two Blood Moon, two Choke, a Rule of Law, two Ancient Grudge, two Fracturing Gust, and two Thalia Gardener Thraben. Unsurprisingly, you're not going to find a lot of cards that are good against the black-green strategies like we saw in the previous it's format. It's interesting. All 15 of Kibler's sideboard cards are hate cards for different varieties of combo decks. Yep. And normally you see like about seven slots devoted to that. He actually has, I believe it's all 15 are just combo cards. Yeah. So I mean, taking a look at what he can actually do here, again, as you mentioned, most of these cards are for combo decks. So, I mean... I don't think he boards anything. I was going to say, I don't know. stretching with Mind Sensor and Thalia? He could board in Blood Moon. It would certainly take away Ian's ability to get to, to cast Obliterator. I don't think it's worth it. Ian, have? Ian only has six non-basic lands oh, wow. in his deck. Okay. There are four swamps, so if he, if he suspects a Blood Moon, he could still get all four swamps. Okay. But you'd have to get four fetch lands for that, and that's not even real, really a guarantee. I guess you know, it, it could be a situation where Brian could potentially catch him off guard. We'll see if he does opt to board that in. But again, I'm kind of with you. I don't think he's going to sideboard a lot in this particular matchup, just simply because he doesn't have the tools. Yeah, yeah. I don't. It's, he, mu he likes his matchup against fair decks. He wants to hate out combo decks. I, I certainly believe that because he's, he's playing a big zoo deck and not a counter cat deck, his game one against combo decks, by and large, will be pretty weak. He's yep. a little, he can't really race them and he can't really disrupt them. And that's why we see a sideboard so dedicated to winning those matchups. Of course, if you guys are just joining us, Cedric Phillips, Matthias Hunt, Star City Games presents Grand Prix Richmond, the largest constructed tournament of all time. We are in round number four, watching Brian Killer play against Ian Hendry, Big Zoo versus Green Black Rock. Of course, if you do want to join us on Twitter, it's the place to be at SCG Live, hashtag GP Richmond. We'll be here for nine rounds today. We'll have six rounds tomorrow, along with our elimination rounds as well, before we do crown the champion of the largest constructed tournament of all time. We want to thank everybody who came out here for this tournament to come play, all 4,300 of you, as well as everybody who's watching at home. We've got a lot of people watching, and we do appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, this has been such an exciting Grand Prix so far. Just the sheer volume of players here is really, is really excellent. Yeah. Um, I mean, you see so many different... I love that it's a format like Modern, too, because you get to see so many different decks. Uh, looking at the 3-0 tables uh, during the last round, you know, I saw... So, you know, decks, pretty much every deck in the format I saw represented. There were some players I was really happy to see playing Amulet Bloom. I saw a player <laughs> winning a game with a Ghoul Caller's Bell in Limited. You better that believe it. That actually happen in, in Modern. He's 3-0, yep. so, you I, know. I love it. Yeah, that's a card I didn't even play in Limited. So <laughs> it's... You didn't draft Spider Spawning very much, did you? Uh, you I did. I just didn't like playing Bell. <laughs> That deck was a little too difficult for me. I like travel preparations. Make it very easy. I like some ABC magic. Yeah. You see both these players are going to finish shuffling up, and we'll be underway here for game number two shortly. Again, uh, we do have a backup match that is of interest as well. Shahar Shenhar, the current world champion. If we do have time to go that way, we certainly will do so. But we turn our attention here to the Hall of Famer and two-time Pro Tour champion Brian Kibler, and we'll see if the underdog here in Ian Hendry down a game can come back and win this match as he takes a look at a hand of Dark Confidant, a couple lands. There's also a Victim of Night hanging out as well. Yeah, and this seems like something he would he would pretty much want to keep. It's removal spells and card draw and a scavenging ooze. And that seems to be more or less the recipe for his deck. Yeah, I mean, the question, of course, is, you know, how much better can his hand get? And I, I'm inclined to believe not much better. I think the only thing that would make it a little bit better is a Frexian Obliterator instead of one of those lands. So, I mean, I, I, if I'm Ian, I don't expect the, uh, the Dark Confidant to live. But I still think the hand is certainly keepable. But even if the Dark Confidant... So, if the Confidant doesn't live, then you can eat it with scavenging ooze. Mm -hmm. There's even value to be had there. Kibler going to take a look at his hand as Ian announces he's going to keep. 
of course, we will have difficulties catching it, and he does have a blood moon in his hand, so we had a feeling he might board that in, and he does, and he's going to keep his hand. Hendrick going to play a Verdant Catacombs, and I think momentarily we might see him pass the turn, and we do. Kibler will take a draw. You see he's got a couple copies of Aired Mesa planes over there. Looks like he's just going to play the fetch land and pass the turn back over to Hendry, who draws another copy of Dark Confidant. So this is really going to be a grindy game, it looks like. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that favors Ian. It depends how many removal spells Kibler has. Ian has the ability to answer all of Kibler's creatures, and if he does, the game favors him. If, however, he lets a creature slip through, it could be really... Like, he probably can't let a single creature slip through. Some of the creatures that Brian plays are so dangerous once they get to untap, especially like Knight of the Reliquary, that... You know, Ian has a card draw right now, but he doesn't actually have the physical kill spells outside of a one Victim of Night. I was very interested to see exactly what land Ian was going to search up there. He does opt for a forest. Could have searched up an Overrun Tomb, obviously. Chose not to. He's going to play a Swamp now, and he's going to cast Dark Confidant. We'll likely see Kibler sacrifice Arid Mesa on the end step and search for some sort of non-basic land, taking one damage in the process. But Blood Moon is a card that, due to a lot of things in the Pro Tour, Blue Moon becoming a deck, we saw a lot of Blood Moons in the sideboards of decks. Um, if Ian is familiar with Kibler, he knows that he has access to Blood Moon in the sideboard. Blood Moon playing a huge role in the modern format right now. Blood Moon was very well positioned at the Pro Tour. Um, a lot of players were playing control decks or combo decks or playing just far too many colors. Um, and I think Blood Moon now, players are trying to adapt to it. We saw. Uh, even in round two, Chris Pakula play, Chris Pakula's opponent's playing around Blood Moon, even though he'd never actually seen the card cast on sure. Pakula's side. It feels like kind of, you know, at this point, especially in sideboarding games, you have to be very cognizant of a deck that has red mana, even if they have not basics. They yeah. might have access to that card. And this should be nothing new to players who play a lot of Legacy. Certainly we see players play around Wasteland all the time in this fashion. So Kibler with the planes in his hand, you see he's going to shuffle furiously, as he always does, considering the ramifications of leaving a Dark Confidant alive versus killing. And I think his only removal spell right now, Matthias, is a path to exile. You really hate to path your opponent's two drop. He's not going to. Not he's just going to play a Tarmogoyf. That's going to be a 1-2 due to Verdant Catacombs, and Bob yeah. will reveal a Misty Rainforest. Say Tarmo Squires, I'd like to say. <laughs> For now. For now. For now. So Hendry's hand is very land heavy. Again, he kept the four land hand with the scavenging use of Victim of Night and that Dark Confidant. He's got a, the Victim, obviously, the scavenging use, I believe, another Confidant in hand and just a bunch of lands. So he, ha he still is looking for more kill spells. I, I think we'll see a scavenging use this turn. I'm not positive, though. A set There's an argument to be made for playing a second Dark Confidant, really. A little risque. Yeah, it certainly is risky to make a play like that. I don't. One should be good. I'm a little bit interested. I know it's kind of crazy talk, I guess, but you know, sending him a Dark Confidant here into a 1-2 Tarmogoyf, yeah, I was going to bring this up. Is, are, would you be happy making this trade? No, not really. No? I think Dark Confidant is just too valuable to make this trade. Um, Especially when you have a backup one? I want, I, the backup one is there to be a backup, not so that I can <laughs> throw away the first one. Well, I mean, you know, throwing it away is one thing. I mean, killing a Tarmogoyf for the Dark Confidant, it, it could, you could argue that's a win. One could know. argue. You can argue it's a win. I, I think Confidant's how he's winning the game, though. No. I, you know, once they start drawing the same number of cards, the game becomes a lot easier for Brian. Brian going to tap that stomp ground. There is a Noble Hierarch. There's an Arid Mesa, and he's going to use a path on this one, which I think is a smart play, even though, you know, obviously yeah. we're working with some very good information. Right, so he's pathing there. Normally, normally people path during the upkeep, but obviously you don't want to do that against our Confidant. Mm -hmm. And right, and this is a situation which, while I had previously thought it favored Ian, I'm not so sure that's true anymore now that he's lost both his Dark Confidants. I think that was the danger in making the trade. Sure. Ian going to search out a Swamp, get him one step closer to casting a Phyrexian Obliterator. We might see him sacrifice Mr. Rainforest in the end step. We might not. We'll see what happens here. But Kibler trying to turn this around a little bit. He's got a lot of removal in his hand. I think I caught two more copies of Path to Exile. So and I think, you know, Brian's looking at that Blood Moon now going, eh, not so good. He presents. <laughs> yeah. You can, you, yeah. Well, you know, the fetch land shortcuts and all of that stuff. But he, will, he is going to search out a land here. We'll see if Ian's going to search out another basic or if he's going to get over to him. It looks like he's going to go for forest. He's still going for forest. So you can, and he's doing that end step instead of main phase, presumably because he just doesn't want to draw more lands mm -hmm. at this point. You can tell that he's very, very cognizant of the card Blood Moon, though. As he's he's certainly playing basics. around it, yeah. And to be fair, it is in Brian's hand. Yep. Ian will take a draw here. That's a copy of Maelstrom Pulse. 
And the game on Ian, the difficulty on Ian's side is going to be to not run out of cards that matter. I mean, Brian has a lot of removals, he said. Brian doesn't have very many threats that Ian has to care about, but the removal is pretty real. Let's see what we have here. It looks like it's going to be time to deploy that scavenging ooze. Yeah, and I believe he even has a backup ooze for the first one. Okay. There's currently just a pair of creatures in the yard. That's the, the Goyf and Bob that traded. Now, do you want to? I like this play, because I was going to ask you, when do you want to do this? And you see, he's going to sacrifice his fetch land in response to Brian sacrificing his Arid Mesa. He's going to take two from the Overgrown two, but he wants to make this into a 4-4 four -four based off of what happened last game. And that's really wise to go ahead and do that. Yeah, he's, he's playing around Lightning Bolt very well. Mm -hmm. So he takes two, gains two. And now he has a 4-4, and it's safe from Bolt and Lightning Helix. Forces Kibler to have a card like Path Exile, which I believe he does have another copy in his hand. But again, if you're able to shut off Lightning Bolt and Lightning Helix as an answer to scavenging, you're obviously taking a step in the right direction. Well, what, that's one of the strengths of the creatures in Ian Hendry's deck. He has, his creatures are Obliterator, Ooze, Tarmogoyf, Corsair of Crufix. Dark Confound is really the only creature that dies to Lightning Bolt. So Kibler's going to search out a stomping ground with that Arid Mesa, and after he has done furiously shuffling, he will untap and take his turn. And we'll see exactly what he's got. We know, again, he has that Blood Moon that's not going to play a huge role in this game. You see a Path Exile in his hand, but he's looking for a creature to really get the party started. All right. Yeah, it's... Ian has been given a lot of time yeah. right now, and that's he's going to really use that so well. There is the yeah. path. And Brian is forced to use that to take care of the use. And again, this is going to be a main phase path as opposed to an upkeep path, which we oftentimes see. Yeah, now in this situation, all the main phase path does is it lets him hit with his Noble Hierarch if he wants. Yep. Kibler are going to sacrifice a Misty Rainforest, going to search out a basic forest. We'll see what his follow play is going to be here. It's possible at this point in the game that giving Ian, giving Ian lands isn't particularly relevant. He is going to play a Blood Moon. All right, so Kibler now has red, red, white, green in play. Now, I actually think there's a lot to that play. And I'll tell you why. Let's say that we play a third game here. I think Brian's going to immediately sideboard out Blood Moon. Yes. But it's something for Hendry to think about when he's searching out his lands. Now, what, Henry has demonstrated that it's not very difficult yeah. for him to be able to actually find those cards. Henry got game. He got game two. Yeah. You know, he, he they played the 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 game of do you have yeah do you play Blood Moon? Can I play around it? And I think I think Ian got him game two. But yeah. now the question is, can Brian get him back game three by making Ian still be cognizant of it? Henry. Yeah, Henry may. He, now the question is, he's on the kill everything plan, but does it actually kill everything? Like, do we do we have to kill this noble hierarch? Mm -hmm. There's scavenging ooze. Yep, ooze is in. Yeah. Okay, so he's going to have Victim of Night first, and I think he's going to play scavenging ooze and then make it a 3 3. Okay. Both players agree that that's okay. Unfortunately for entry, that's in bolt range, and Kibler has one. Yeah, I, I almost would have wanted. He can't ever get it out of bolt range now that Blood Moon's in play because okay. he only plays two forests. Okay, gotcha. So he just kind of has to take that lump. As it were. And there's a bolt to take care of that, and there's a big dumb elephant locks on Smiter. 4-4 four, four encounterable. Yeah. Bolt, I don't know about Victim of Night on Noble Hierarch, how necessary that was. Um, either way, Ian has plenty of removal, and we're going to see another one take down Luxed on Smiter. And there's an abrupt to get to take that down, saving the Maelstrom Pulse that's in his hand. And I, I'm kind of with you in that situation, as there's a Birds of Paradise. You know, I, I want to say, I want to pick my spots better than Victim of Night. You know, there are definitely some high-impact cards like a Knight of the Reliquary that can really take this game over here. Even a Tarmogoyf is quite good in yeah. this situation. I believe Hendry drew a Phyrexian Obliterator, which he can no longer mm. cast. All right, Blood Moon, there is Tarmogoyf now. He did at one point fetch for that o for that overgrown tomb, yep. too. And that's going to get him pretty... Like, he has to naturally draw that last uh, swamp to cast the Obliterator. Well, I think the awkward thing now is that if you're, if you're Ian, you have to Maelstrom Pulse a Blood Moon when you didn't want to. Right. You would rather just have that to take care of Tarmogoy for night or whatever, but it's so important to be able to deploy this, uh, this, this obliterator. obliterator. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, he actually, the Blood Moon was worth the card, and Brian <laughs> has the path. Did it again. Well, if you're Ian, you do get to search out one more basic from your deck because he does have another swamp. And now Ian's on the back foot again. Yep. Here comes Tarmogoy in for five. Andrew's going to go down to 12. 
And I think because this is a late game that you get to a lot in this matchup, that's why I was saying cards like Dark Confront are just so good. Yeah. You know, Ian would have a lot of extra cards at this point. Yeah. And that maybe would be enough for him to have board control. Brian's really only, it's only, he's only one removal spell from being, it's one card behind, mm -hmm. right? And to be here, he's drawn a lot more lands. He is on nine to Kibler's five. The paths have helped with that. Uh, there's a slaughter pack. That's not a bad draw. Hendry's going to play a land and pass the turn back. Kibler will take a draw here. Let's see what he finds. He's going to attack. There's a slaughter pact. And very smartly going to get the die to make sure that he does not lose the game. Yeah, I, that's a great play. I, I do that a lot. I see a lot of players still not doing that because, you know, whoa, I don't need that reminder. Yeah. And this really, it's free. You should just take it. Yes. If they're giving it to you for free, just take it. You see, he's going to figure out exactly how he wants to tap his mana for the Slaughter Pact. There's the payment. Here's a draw from Hendry. There's another copy of Slaughter Pact. So, this uh, is great for Black Green Rock. It's yep. just all kill spells and card advantage. His card advantage will be in the form of Liliana of the Veil and Dark Con for the two remaining Dark Confidants, and he has two Corsair of Crufix as well. Scavenging is off the top after sacrificing your Rising Canopy there for Kibler. Take a look at the graveyards. There are some creatures hanging out down there as both players will consult that. I think Ian's deciding whether or not he wants to slaughter Pax yep. to pay now. He's going to go ahead and do that. Because Kibler's playing Big Zoo, Ian is forced to really kill every creature. Mm -hmm. Every creature matters. Yeah, everyone will kill you. Let's see, he's going to put that die back on top again. Make sure that he pays for the slaughter pack. Let's see what Hendry draws for this turn. That's Liliana the Veil. Not bad. It's very strong. It's one of his card advantage engines. He, I believe we'll see him plus it. Yep. That takes care of it. Looks like he got a full creature out of yeah. Kibler's hand. Now, oof. Thundermaw Hellkite, a top deck. That's a huge top deck. Yeah, it is. That's going to take care of Liliana. So things are changing like crazy here. Let's see what Hendry can draw. Was that maybe a scavenging a creature? Ooze? Yeah, scavenging ooze is not bad here. And there's a, the creature, the graveyards have been, a lot of creatures have hit the graveyard since we saw our last scavenging ooze. We see, at least some have. We see Hendry's going to activate the scavenging ooze right now. It's going to go to a Is it actually, three. it's just once maybe, I thought we saw multiple guys Well, Brian's, Brian act actually activated his scavenging ooze. Oh, okay, when bunch, it died. Yeah, to prevent Ian's from actually being good. So sometimes you see people leave and sometimes you don't. As Wild Mikado comes off the top here after Brian attacks for five, turns out a pretty smart play there from Kibler by removing the other ones because now Ian's scavenging ooze is much worse. Yeah, and that Birds of Paradise is being a pain in Ian's side. I believe he's drawn another Liliana if he edicts. It's gonna, the birds will eat, will take the edict as opposed to anything else. Kibler draws his card, still has Thundermile out there. Hendry at eight life. Kibler could also attack there with a wild Nakato. That's very risky, obviously, because if Ian has a removal spell for Thundermile, he kills that, blocks Nakato, and pumps the ooze. So. I like how Ian played that, I or how Kibler played that, yep. because it just wasn't worth getting blown out, especially not when you have a, a Thundermaw. Overgrown Tomb, pass the turn back over to Kibler. Kibler's going to untap. He's going to draw. Yeah. I think we're going to see some more red zone. Yeah, so now Lightning Bolt and Lightning Helix are... Yeah, it doesn't matter. He does not find an answer to the dragon, and Kibler 2-0 is going to go ahead and take the match. Congratulations to Brian Kibler. Big Zoo, his first round after the bye. He's 4-0 on the day so far. Ian Hendry does end up losing this match with Green Black Rock, and you see some of the power of the Big Zoo deck there because it does have a lot more staying power than Little Zoo. Yeah, I mean, instead of top decking Loam Lions, Kibler's top decking 